Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Textile Talk. I'm Martha Seelman. I'm the Executive Director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. Uh, we are one of six organizations who organize these textile talks along with the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, the Quilt Alliance, the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles and Surface Design Association, Studio Art Quilt Associates or SAQA, SACWA, is a membership organization of 4,200 members who live all over the world and who all are passionate about art quilts. We do um, magazines, we do get togethers, we do educational webinars, and uh, we'd love to have you join us and consider being a member. Our big event coming up at the end of April is going to be our conference due to health concerns. This year we will again be virtual, which is actually a ton of fun because you can join in from anywhere in the world. The information about the conference is at sakwa.com slash virtual. It's going to take place over two Friday, Saturday combinations um, so that nobody gets Zoom fatigue but we're really excited to have Janet Eckelman come and talk about her absolutely gigantic fiber sculptures that are now in major cities around the world, to have Jim Arendt, who is a wonderful artist and professor, talk about his life creating fiber art, to have a museum panel moderated by Kidra Navaroli, who was the curator at the Ruth Funk Center for Textile Art in Florida. And she's going to be joined by three other curators from all over Florida. We're gonna have a wonderful student panel come and talk about the work that they're doing as part of their art degree, as well as several other great artists talking about how you can really enjoy your maker practice as an artist working in fiber. I hope that you'll check out the website, sakwa.com slash virtual, and consider coming to the conference. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to record everything. So if you can't be there right in that moment, you won't miss a thing. And I hope that we will see you. Today, I have the pleasure of sharing with you three of the artists who were juried in to what we call the Intersect Chicago 2021 exhibition. Intersect Chicago is usually an in-person event um, that um, celebrates art from all different kinds of mediums. It takes place at the Navy Pier in Chicago. Unfortunately, in 2021, it had to be canceled due to health concerns, um, but we had already juried the exhibition and we wanted to share some of the absolutely amazing art that would have been on display um, in Chicago in November. And um, so today we're going to be hearing from three artists, Nancy Billings, Michael Ross, and Donna Deaver. And if you are inspired by their art, we just posted the call for entry for the Intersect Chicago 2022 show on the SACWA website. So be sure to check that out and see if that's something that you would be interested in entering with your art. Um, unlike a lot of our exhibitions, there is no theme. We're just looking for the best in fiber art. It can be two-dimensional, three-dimensional, installations hung from the ceiling, we'll make it work. And we'd love to have you be part of that process. So we're going to start by hearing from Nancy Billings. She's going to tell you a little bit about her work and her studio practice. Then we'll hear from Michael Ross. And finally, we'll hear from Donna Deaver. As you listen to their presentations, please post your questions in either the chat or the Q&A box. Um, and I will be you know, keeping track of them as they come in. And then I will share your questions with the three artists um, towards the end of the program. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Nancy, take it away.
you will need to unmute. There you are. Hi. Hi, everyone. So nice to see everybody there. Uh, I am Nancy Billings. I have been doing art quilting and traditional quilting for 45 years. And I am now at the point where I do only art quilting. Next. This is Miami Cross Currents, which was uh, exhibited at the Ruth Funk Center for Textile Art in Melbourne, Florida a number of years ago. <clears throat> You'll notice that my art is in small pieces and there's a reason for that. I could not any longer create large pieces with my sewing machine. And so I decided to figure out a way to be able to construct my art the way I wanted. I also decided to get away from <clears throat> the um, traditional binding of my quilts. So all my threads are loose and hanging and many of my work now I call hanging by a thread, which you'll see in a little bit next. This cascade was a sample piece. It's only 15 by 15. <clears throat> I was trying to see whether I could get some movement with the stitching and um, some painting along with it. And I really enjoyed the sampling and testing how to do this. Next. We are all hanging by a thread was my piece that I went to when COVID shut us all down. It represents all the threads, all the fabrics represent all the people, all our communities, small, tiny little communities to large worldwide and how we're all different and how we have different personalities and different colors and different ideas and how we are all hanging by a thread and how we must hang together. We need each other. Next. Skin Deep was the very first piece that I did with the small squares. And I had such a good time with it and it was my inspiration to keep doing more. Next. This is almost self-explanatory. Uh, democracy hanging by a thread was my answer to the political turmoil that we are all going through. I decided to take my art and translate it to what I was feeling. It was actually all put together and my son came in and said, Mom, you've got to cut one of those squares to show how difficult this whole thing is. And I cut it and I thought, okay, that was perfect. Next. And here's another one of my flags. I did three of them like this, all changing what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And some of this has um, uh, gold leafing in it also. Next. This is also another, the third one. And as you could see, the gold leafing is a little stronger. Next. The uh, Amendment 19 is the anniversary of the women's vote for getting the, the, the anniversary for women getting the vote. And I decided to take my work and move it to a different level. So there's no fabric behind it. I used um, uh, my hand dyed velvet. This was for a challenge for a new fiber art group that I was a member of. And we had a show and each one of the pieces was 50, 40 by 60 inches. 
And this was another challenge. I like to give myself challenges and push my art as far as I can with each uh, new event. Next. And this is how you see I hang my art. I have created lucite bars which hold the art away from the wall. So the shadows become part of the art. Next. Taking it one step further, since I was enjoying this process, I decided to translate love into different languages and hope that the um, message would come across that we all need love in every country. And it all means the same. Next. My new challenge was that I was participating in an Art Basel uh, exhibit down here in Miami. Art Basel turns Miami into one big art gallery. Every gallery, museum, every place there's empty space turns into an art gallery. So this was my beginning. I uh, created the background, which is layered fabrics. I stitched it. I painted it gold. And then I stitched words on it and decided the in the same velvet. And the first one I did, I didn't do the embroidery on and it felt very flat. So I did the embroidery, which I haven't done in years and really loved it. And they are um, mounted on uh, canvas mounts on the back. Next. This is another one of the pieces that goes into the um, exhibit for Art Basel. And I did this with another friend and it was a collaborative piece. And um, the next slide please is our collaboration. So my friend Marlene Cohn and I, I did the gold pieces and she did the blues and we hung this in one of the art venues for Art Basel and she uses tar paper as her medium and paint and stitching also. I thank you. It's been a pleasure to share my art with you all. I love creating and I love pushing myself where I didn't think I could go. Thanks so much. And now Michael Ross. Hi everybody. Thanks for joining in today. What I'm gonna do is I wanna give you a little bit of background, show some pictures of my studio. And then I also want to show you some pieces that I made that led up to the creation of Grayscale Study Number no. 2, the piece that was juried into Intersect Chicago. And then after that, show you several pieces that I've done since then and how that Grayscale Study kind of was the beginning of um, some of the effects and things that I wanted to explore in those later pieces. So if you'd start, Lucy, with the first um, studio pictures. So this is my dye space. I dye all of my fabric, well, most of it, and I use ProChem uh, Fiber Reactive MX dyes, and I have four portable washing machines that you can, one of them is kind of blocked by the wider machine over on the right side there. But, and I also use uh, Test Fabrics 419 bleached mercerized cotton for my fabric in dyeing. I also do um, all of my long arm quilting, in the next slide, you can see a little bit further up in my basement, my long arm, it's a Bernina Q24. And these are kind of next to each other in the basement. Upstairs in a room is my cutting and sewing space. And it's a little tight to get a good picture. So I don't have one to share with that. But as background, I started with Nancy, started working with Nancy Crow uh, just over five years ago. And I began with her first class in strip piecing and Right after that, I made um, this next slide is a piece that came um, after that class. It's called Structures Number One. And this is basically really just 
full on strip piecing as Nancy teaches it and has us working in that class. This was done just over five years ago. And uh, from there then, a couple of years later, about a year later, I was working um, in some different areas, but still kind of dabbling with strip piecing. And I'll show you the next piece. This is called fractured prism. Now this is commercial fabric. This, um, these were all jelly roll strips that I bought early, early on in my days of just when I was starting to explore quilting long before I ever worked with Nancy. And it actually took me several years to figure out what to do with these because I didn't want to just do, you know, long blocks of strips and like, you know, like what mostly is usually done with jelly rolls. I just wanted to do something different. So I don't think I would have come up with this if I hadn't worked with Nancy and doing that strip piece in class. But one thing that's interesting in here is that it started the process of me exploring art and visual perception. And what that really means is how, you know, I had always kind of figured that we see depth or we perceive depth pretty much by value alone. So that the darkest elements can come forward, the lightest elements can go back, or we can reverse it and have it have the opposite effect happen in our work. But in this piece, I noticed you can kind of see on the left edge and the right edge with that bright green, and then you have that bright yellow. I would think that they would kind of be in the same plane, but the way that everything is layered, to my eye, it's kind of looking like the yellow is coming forward a little bit more than that green. And I couldn't figure out why that was happening. So that was the beginning of me starting to explore visual perception, which is a very strong aspect of my work to this day. And I love working with, now that I understand how to use value um, along with color in a much better way, I'm able to create this. And I think it's a really interesting thing that I enjoy um, to create in my work, to let people kind of see the layer effects and um, the different visual impact that it can have. So this is Fractured Prism. This was the first piece that I really started to notice that. So this really kind of influenced where I was going with the study based on the layering and also then the visual perception and the work that I do to this day. So the next slide that I have to show you is I was leading up to um, the grayscale study number two was made as a study before I began an independent study uh, for two weeks with Nancy Crow. And I wanted to have something to kind of refer to. So these were actually panels that I made in that independent study class. I was continuing exploring with some strip piecing, but the thing that started to happen with the strip piecing as it was in this grayscale is that for the first time, I was able to actually perceive each panel as its own overall value and not be distracted so much by the individual individual value of the stripes. So you can see from the top piece, it's pretty much the darkest, and then the bottom is the lightest. So in the next slide, you'll see I took these panels and cut them up, and you can see different layered effects. It has a, a dynamic energy to it, just given the diagonals and the direction that are happening, even with some of the same panels that are cut in different directions. Now, this is something I was doing during the independent study. And I'm sharing this because when I was making the grayscale study, I didn't take very many process pictures. So I wanted to kind of illustrate the concept of what I was going and what I did in that study, even though it's a little bit out of order chronologically. So in the next piece, I had, so at this point, this is the beginning of grayscale study number two. And I had already made the strip pieced panels, but those were off on the side. So this began with the figures and I wanted to explore creating texture and I wasn't really using the values in this aspect so much for creating depth. It was really more of just kind of creating more of a textural effect with the figures. These started out as black pieces that were cut and then I inserted these different grays into them piece by piece and then eventually recut it so that it was in the same shape that I had originally roughed in on my design wall. So in the next slide, these are the, those black figures textured are underneath all of this. And here I've pinned up and luckily I took a picture, even though it's a little hard to see exactly what's going on. These are different stripe panels that I had put together and trying to create the different ground shapes that would go behind the figures. 
and also trying to explore a little bit more about this layering effect and the depth and the visual perception. So in the next slide, you'll see the finished piece as it was and as it's finished. So it's the, the values that were used in these background pieces weren't as um, distinct as the ones that I showed you initially, that, that stack of the panels. So there's a little bit of depth going on here. There's some layering. There's a dynamic feel to both the figures and the background. And I really, I realized that when I was doing this, I was throwing a lot at this piece and I was asking a lot of the viewer to kind of follow along. I think that of the two studies that I did, I do think this is, this is the stronger of the two. And so it was an interesting experiment. I will point out one thing in this piece here is that with my quilting, I tend to not have um, quilting added as a layer of design, particularly in these pieces that are cut with intricate shapes and using value. I Because I dye my fabric, I want the colors and the shapes that I cut in my other work, not, not this piece necessarily, this is all commercial with Kona Grays. But, and so it's kind of a one-off in that regard of not using my hand eyes. But I prefer to have the shapes that I cut, the colors that I choose to really be what I want the viewer to focus on and not have them, um, just kind of have them look through the quilting. And that's just my own, my own personal preference. I love it, other quilting when I see it on other people's work, but it's just when I see mine, this is how I want mine to appear. And I use a clear uh, polyester uh, monofilament thread on this. So after this piece, this was done in the spring of 2019, and it took a few years. I've done a lot of other pieces, large scale and freehand cuts and a lot of colors and everything. But in 2020, I think it was around November, I came back to some black and white pieces. I was doing some ruler cuts and I was using um, strips, a little bit of strip piecing, but not like what I did initially. So in the next piece, the next photo, this is um, part of a series. This is, let's see, XVP. It stands for Experiments in Visual Perception. And I really wanted to play around more with value and depth. And I had been kind of stuck creatively for most of the summer in 2020. And just to simplify things and get myself out of a rut, I decided to, to uh, just focus on 45 degree and 90 degree cuts. And I was using a ruler for these pieces. And I just wanted to have a really striking, strong geometric effect. And although I do most of my cuts freehand, I knew that the, the geometric effect that I wanted would not be achievable without a ruler. So for the first few pieces in this series, I used a ruler and it did not make it easier. I will tell you that, especially after getting used to freehand cutting. So this was the first piece, this is number three in the series. And I had done two black and white pieces before this. Again, this is quilted and it's with the monofilament thread. You can see a little bit towards the bottom where the lights were kind of casting a little bit of a shadow on the quilting. So in the next slide, this is also part of the XVP series. And this was done a couple of months after the previous slide. And at this point, I wanted to go back to doing freehand cuts, but I was kind of thinking back to the grayscale study number two as I began this. I wanted the piece to be create this piece to be created purely improvisationally. So I went into my fabric sashes. I pulled out some shapes that were leftover pieces from previous uh, pieces that I had made. And so this large red shape at the bottom is one that was in my fabric stash, and the larger yellow shape at the top was also in there. So I cut out these rectangular shapes, and I wanted to play around with more of a solid kind of ground shape, I'm uh, sorry, as, um, solid as more of the figure, and then using these stripes as more of a background. So as I was doing the XVP series, especially the ones with the rulers, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, I mean, I loved working in a large format. That's, that's my first preference. So I was kind of thinking at that point, you know, at some point I should probably try to do a large format ruler cut piece, 45 degree and 90 degree cut. So last summer, about May of 2021, I started working on the next piece, 
called Confluence, number one. And you can see this finished at 86 by 84. It was about 90 by 90 when it went on to the long arm, but just in the quilting and everything, it, it finished a little bit smaller. So this was, this took me several months. And a lot of it, again, there was no sketch. There was no plan. I had no idea if it was even going to work when I started it. So I basically spent a month just sewing all kinds of triangles with strips together and not having any plan of where they would go to. And I think I probably had 50 sets of triangles. Some of them were really large. Some of them were, you know, medium sized. And then I went to my design wall, which is eight feet square. And I started just trying to find things that looked like they could go together. And eventually I was able to finish this. And this is also quilted with the monopoly filament thread, but this was done freehand. And it's a little hard to see in this picture, but I, I quilted this edge to edge with kind of a wave pattern. It's not even, it's not symmetrical, and it has more of a dynamic flow to it. I started quilting it with my computer and it was giving me a lot of problems and I had almost finished the whole thing. So I ripped out all of the stitches I washed the top and then I pressed it and then I put it back on the long arm and I did it freehand. And so that was much easier. And that's all that I have to share for today. Thank you very much. And next up is Donna Deaver. Hey, hi everybody. Uh, give me just a minute. I need to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that now. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Martha, for this opportunity to speak today. I'm here to talk about Rainy Day Strasbourg, my piece that was juried into Inner Sex Chicago. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the evolution of my work and how I came to make this piece. I grew up in a career military family and moved extensively throughout the United States throughout my childhood and my early teen years. We live mostly in the coastal regions of the United States. Because of this, I credit this with my high level of curiosity, wanderlust, and my extensive love of the ocean. All of these come through in my work, as you'll see. I work primarily in stitched surfaces using my own hand-dyed fabrics and paint. In 2008, I began using a fused collage technique building up layers of colors with my own hand-dyed fabrics. Unlike Michael, my work usually does include dense rhythmic free motion quilting, which is an element of it. I use it to create dimension and add texture. Lay me to rest on the hill by the sea is a good example of this dimensional quilting. There's very dense quilting in the background, gradually, gradually loosening up as the eye moves forward into the foreground. It was inspired by a trip to Scotland in 2017. The beaches on the Outer Hebrides are so beautiful and so untouched, but as I discovered, life can be hard on such remote islands. We happened upon this little cemetery overlooking Leskintyre Beach on the Isle of Harris. After hearing generations of hard and often dangerous work, I felt the need to tell the stories of lives lived and sacrificed in such a beautiful place. This was the last piece in my ocean series that spanned 2014 to 2018. Here you can see the quilting in a little bit more detail. Jester's Pond continued my love of water and reflection, not part of the ocean series since it's a freshwater pond and autumn reflections, which came from a sketch done during one of mine and my husband's hiking trips in Maine. My ink and watercolor sketching practice began to evolve at the same time as my textile work. It really began with taking a sketchbook and supplies on a trekking trip to Italy in 2013 with my husband. I returned home with a visual journal full of wonderful memories. I often look through old sketchbooks and can get transported back to the moment with much greater clarity than from taking a photograph. 
but I haven't taken a trip since without packing my supplies in a sketchbook dedicated to that particular trip. A great source for sketching is always where I live in North, is always where I live in Northern Idaho in the US. I'm a member of Urban Sketchers International, a plein air sketching group whose mantra is to see the world one drawing at the end of time. We capture what we see from direct observation rather than from photographs. From the very beginning, I fell in love with the process. It consumes many, many hours, but I always sketch for the pure joy of it. My sketch outing, outings take a lot of time, especially since I pack up all my supplies and go wandering through my neighborhood or through town or, or drive to a location to sketch. When weather prohibits outdoor work, I find random objects around the house to draw. My art supplies are always a favorite and they're always changing. This is pretty much what I travel with without the containers that you see. I've always struggled to find enough time to balance my sketching and my textile work, which were for many years very separate and unrelated practices. Full immersion in either compromises time for the other. In 2019, I began exploring free motion stitching on whole cloth to resemble my ink sketches. Then I added painting in either watercolor or textile paint. This new series that is called Textile Sketchbooks continues as I combine the two methods of working, using lessons and elements from both. I use sketches from various travel sketchbooks to create new textile pieces. View from the Water was inspired by the canals from the iconic buildings in Amsterdam from a trip in 2018. Here you can see my original sketch. Riverbank is another piece from that same trip in 2018. In 2020, I began painting with a bit more color and created Descent to the Mediterranean from one of my early sketches from that trip to Italy that started all of this. After that piece was made, I began to feel like my sketches really needed figures in order to come to life. I added my first simple figures to Rainy Day, which I created to visit to Strasbourg, France in 2018. This is a piece that was selected for Intersect Chicago. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's one of the few pieces in this series that did not start with a pen and ink sketch. Instead, I created a digital sketch from my many photographs in that trip. Sketching digitally allowed me to play with color or lack thereof, quilting lines, and adding or eliminating elements. I could move the figures around to suit me and make sure that the composition was sound before I committed it to fabric. The process has been the same for all of my pieces in this series. I enlarged my sketch, traced just the bones of it onto the fabric to begin my free motion embroidery and that I do on my stationary boner machine. Once the embroidery is done and the scene is complete, I begin the painting process. And I, this is the part that is so terrifying for me after, put, after spending so much time doing all of that thread work to start putting paint down. I never know what it's gonna turn out like and it's never like I planned. So it's pretty unpredictable. I then began designing the quilting and adding that on. Rainy Day is another one that I use that dimensional quilting. It's, it's a lot looser at the foreground, at the very bottom and the very top, and it gets more dense as you move towards the horizon. Sketching people is intimidating for me and it can get a little uncomfortable, especially if who you're sketching happens to notice. To improve in early 2020, I began sketching some of my photographs so that I can practice figure sketching. <clears throat> Over time with doing this, I began to recognize common postures, the shape of clothing and body language. And I realized that faces were really hard to draw for me and not always needed to communicate what was going on. So I just eliminated the faces and really began to embrace my faces figures. This was a great exercise during 2020 in the solitude of the first year of the pandemic. 
At the end of 2020, I had practiced enough and created a library of sketches that I jumped off the deep end and created connections. This is inspired by photographs that I took at a very busy train station in Paris in 2019. It's a very large piece. It has well over 100 figures in it. It's best appreciated standing close to it so that you can see the detail. In 2021, still missing my travel adventures, I returned to my many travel sketches and photographs, including those of that very wet day in Strasbourg. Rainy Day 2 was then created. Sometimes I just like to draw interesting details rather than a whole scene. So I'll leave you with one of the many gargoyles found on Notre Dame in Paris. Thank you so much for listening. You can find more of my work on my website or social media. If you have questions or comments, always feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. That was wonderful. What three very different and very amazing sets of different approaches to making art in fiber. Uh, Michael and Nancy, if you want to unmute and turn on your video, uh, then we can uh, ask you the questions from our audience. Um, so the first one is from Michael. Michael, did you ever figure out why the green receded? Oh, it well, I started reading a book called Art and Visual Perception by Rudolf Arnheim, which is apparently a classic, very dry classic on this topic. And in, long story short, the basic reason is because of the way the those surrounding pieces were layered. And so when one piece kind of, if you have, I'm doing it the wrong way. So when it crosses over a long way, it's gonna, by nature, it's for most times, it's gonna make whatever's crossed over like that look like it's visually receding, despite the value. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that's the follow-up. Um, there is a question from the audience. They said, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by value? Because that's so important to your work. Uh, well, when I refer to value, it really just, it, it relates to light to dark, basically using a light value to well, what we think like the grayscale from the white being the lightest value to dark being the, the black being the darkest value. So typically when I was saying, I don't know if this is what they're asking, you know, typically when we see something that's a little bit simpler in design, we'll have the black tends to come forward and the white will tend to recede. You see this a lot in magazine ads that are done in black and white. The model's wearing black on a light background in, the, in a field or something. And that's a kind of classic way to let our eyes, that's why we're kind of trained to see figure and ground. It can be reversed though also. So that's kind of, when you throw color into it, it wasn't until I started to learn to see by value and not see by color which that was a huge learning curve. And that, that threw everybody for a loop when Nancy was introducing us to that concept. There were a lot, it was a very uncomfortable couple of weeks when that happened. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry, but I sort my fabrics by value. I do not put my blues in light to dark. I don't even dye a gradation scale. That's very rare that I do that. I just put everything by value and I pull those out knowing where I wanna work. Yeah, um, I think that for most of us, um, we what attracted us to fiber was color. And so it's very hard to set that aside because we love color. That's why we're here. Nancy, yeah. the technical question that everybody wants to know is how do you get them to stick to the wall? Oh, well, <laughs> that was a challenge too. Um, I decided, <clears throat> excuse me, because I had seen some art that was flowing and I liked that concept. And since the threads are see-through, I needed a way to hang the work without showing a rod. So right. I found a Lucite man in my neighborhood and he creates whatever Lucite rod I want. He's been doing this for 10 years for me. So the work all 
uh, hangs from Velcro that I stitch onto the pieces and the glue on L uh, Velcro goes onto the Lucite. Okay. And the Lucite bar is about an inch to an inch and a half deep. So the piece is standing away from the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. And um, the other question is, um, how are the different components, how, how do you get the different components connected by their threads? Are you sewing over something that dissolves or yeah. are you just really, really good at using your machine? <laughs> no, I'm not. I've tried it many, many different times. It was a tremendous challenge. And I use a sulky product. There are many different ones. This is the final one that works for me. It's called Fabri Salvi. So okay. <laughs> it works. It's still, I will challenge, I, I will caution everyone. It's still a challenge to stitch it from piece to piece and not get it too um, tight or loose or whatever. It's still quite a challenge, but it, it's what I love to do. Yeah. And, and uh, somebody just posted what is Lucite? It's a clear plastic. Mm -hmm. Donna. They want to know when you get to that terrifying moment, how do you manage to keep your paint or dye from not bleeding all over? That's, um, yeah, that's been a work in progress there. Um, what I tend to do, I really like the effect of watercolor. And I really wanted to replicate that, which is why I started doing this in watercolor. And it's just a matter of knowing how watery it is and how much it's going to bleed. And because the stitching is there, I can start the painting within the, well within the margin and let some of it flow and just know how much that's going to be. But it has to do with how wet my brush is. I keep something next to me that I test it before I put it on the fabric. And it still doesn't always come out the way you want it to. So I've had some happy accidents and some not so happy accidents. <laughs> what, what kind of paint are you using? I am right now I'm using a product. Um, I'm still using watercolor, but I'm using textile paint um, from Pro Chemical and Dye, the Pro Fab, I think it is. Um, Great. And I water it down quite a bit. Because yeah, well, you, you get those yeah. beautiful grays in, in the most recent bunch of work. Um, Michael, yes. um, you, a lot of your work, the earlier work, was very uh, straight lines. A mm -hmm. uh, lot that strip piecing, obviously, and also the more recent piece, which is very geometric. But then you have all those other pieces that have some really wild curves that we're all jealous that you're able to piece at all. Um, how do you feel that using curves or using straight lines changes how you, the work develops and how you feel about it? I look at it like two different tools in my tool belt. Okay. And I think that it's kind of, um, in my earlier pieces, everything was straight as you're all the straight lines. And then I have ones where I've done where everything is curved. And so the one XVP six that I showed was kind of showing some straight edged pieces that were shorter with the curves. And so I, that was one other thing that I was exploring in that one. So I, to me, I like, I'm finding more and more that I'm even in my bigger pieces with the big shapes that I'm cutting the one I just did one finished one a few weeks ago. And uh, that has straight edges and curves combined in it. So I don't look at I don't know if I'm answering the question or not, but it's, I don't look at them. I, I don't know that it's hard to say how it informs my work or how it develops. I, it, I just kind of I look at each piece as an experiment and things that I want to try and where it goes, I, I don't always know at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I'm working more okay. improvisationally now than I did in my mutation series, which mm -hmm. was- So sometimes you feel like a curve and sometimes you don't. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, and when, then would you talk a little bit because we're um, obviously contrasting your work with Nancy's work, which is very small. Why so big? 
Well, in large parts because of my time spent with Nancy Crow, but, and, and she just started us out. Even that strip piece in class, I had a piece that was, it was over a hundred inches tall and that was my end of week one class. And so it, and, but the thing is, once I got used to it, I, it gives, just gives me so much room to explore different concepts and to have so many different things to try out and to really make a statement. And when you go and you're able to see a piece of that size hanging on a wall in a gallery or a museum, it really has a significant impact. And I really love the way, just like with a big painting in a museum, from a distance, it has one effect. And when you get up closer, you start seeing the paint strokes and you start seeing the little details and things that you're not gonna see. So to my mind, it's a similar um, effect. And so I just, and I just enjoy working big. I don't know, I just mm -hmm. I do. I, I, I find that artists have a size that just speaks to them. And for some people it's very small. And for some people like you, it's very large and then others are in between. But mm -hmm. people tend to gravitate towards a certain range. I mean, it's not exactly the same size, but a certain mm -hmm. range that just seems right to them. The Nancy, pieces, I'm yeah, sorry, the actually pieces, those pieces, that was small for me, the 40 by 60. <laughs> uh, to me, that was shrinking it down. Okay. <laughs> so. Nancy, but sort of contrasting, talk about how working in these modular units affects your work, because of course, that's not how you started working when you were first doing art quilts. No, I... Um, let me intersperse first because I have a question on the questions. I don't make squares for each for a uh, lucite bar for each square. I make one long lucite bar and they all fit onto the bar. Um, the reason I got to the small squares is because I could no longer use big uh, fabrics to push under my sewing machine and I never got a long arm. So, and I wanted to get more into the art place of my head. And I wanted to break loose from the, a lot of people won't like this, the quilt police. And um, I just had to wing it. And Here's how I started it. I was in a Nancy Crow workshop and there was somebody doing some work with something called starters. And she said, would you like one? And I said, yeah, what is it? This was from about 10 years ago. And this woman had dozens of them on her sewing machine. And apparent, I've been sewing since I'm 12. I never knew what a starter was. Apparently you start with these so you don't have the ends of the threads hanging loose. When I saw these, it triggered something in me to start layering the fabric. And I've been doing it ever since and these few little pieces that I have still are on my sewing machine for my inspiration. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get bigger and bigger. I'm working on a commission now that's 77 inches wide and 45 wow. inches tall. So mm -hmm. it's, um, the bigger it gets, the more challenging it gets. Yeah, well, that's always true. Uh, Donna, your earlier work that you showed were uh, landscapes that were fairly rural, no particular people or buildings. And a lot of your sketches seem to be placed in urban environments. And now there's a lot of people. So can you talk a little bit about how that transition really occurred? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Actually, I because I began working in series years ago, and, and you saw a lot of the ones from my Ocean's Edge series, it's, I never get tired of the ocean. So it was kind of hard for me to make a change, but it was sort of what I indicated that my sketching practice, which does happen in towns, we go, I mean, I do a lot of landscape sketching too, but I got pretty interested in architecture and looking at little details and all that. And the reason my work took that big turn is because those were the sketches that when I started looking back through my sketchbooks, that spoke to me about what would this, what would this be like to, to go in that direction? And I've actually began 
exploring some of my more textile sketch, my current style with more landscapes. I, I have a few of them out there, but not many. Um, mm -hmm. But that was kind of a big leap, I agree. Yeah, and do you find that um, these pieces that are so based on line have a different feel for you than the landscapes which were built of much larger blocks of color? Yes, they do. Um, they're dynamic, you know, as architecture can be. Um, they can be calming or not, but more than anything, it's just an exploration. Every single one of them is based on some place I've been. So if I have any of them hanging in my studio, like the one behind me, every time I look at that, I think of being in Paris that particular day, catching the train, to go to the south of France and what that was all about. So I get very different feelings from the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they definitely convey different emotions to the viewer. Um, we are almost out of time. I just want to um, share uh, just how wonderful all the panelists that have been sharing the different ways that they've challenged themselves to grow in their art Thank you all so much for being here. And there are more questions, um, but we're gonna have to cut it off now. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. If you stay on, we're gonna share the full exhibition that would have been in Chicago. And so you can see not only these three pieces, but also the work of the other artists who were in this wonderful collection of art. Thank you for joining us. I hope to see you next week at the next Textile Talk.